Okay, so now this is the time for our next um, activity, uh, activity two on ambiguity. You'll find that activity in the lesson unit um, that you found this uh, 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 video on. Um, so if you want to take a moment, hit pause, uh, complete the activity. It shows you a bunch of pictures and titles uh, of newspapers. Uh, of, of stories in newspapers, and you have to go through and identify if those titles or pictures are lexically ambiguous or syntactically ambiguous. Okay. So once you're done, come back, um, hit play, and we'll go through them together. Okay, so the first one says, Princess Diana dresses to be auctioned. Here we can tell it's lexically ambiguous because dresses can be a noun or a verb, right? As in, she is dressing to be auctioned, or her dresses are made to be auctioned. The second one, sound transit train hits teenage girl survives. This is syntactically ambiguous because we don't know if it's the teenage girl who survives or the transit train that survives. In this one, how much do you want to cut the grass? That much is uh, lexically ambiguous because we don't know if it means the height of the grass, the amount, the desire of the, the child to cut the grass or the amount of money that the, that the child wants. Clinton licks beavers. Licks is lexically ambiguous because it could mean literally licking or it could mean uh, it's a synonym for hurt. Go clean up, please. This is syntactically ambiguous because uh, this statement, you look pretty dirty, Ruthie, could mean you look pretty when you are dirty or it could mean uh, it could, pretty could be an adverb describing the adjective, right? So, Pretty is being used to sort of exacerbate how dirty Ruthie is. Um, and, and that's the second meaning of you look pretty dirty, Ruthie. Uh, and this next one, beat two eggs, that beat is lexically ambiguous because it can mean beating it like the cartoon character does or whisking the eggs. This next one is also lexically ambiguous, house of pizza, because of can mean made of. Or, in this case, it means this is the house where you go to eat pizza. And then the last one, with the Oxford comma, we invited the strippers JFK and Stalin. Without the Oxford comma, we invited the strippers JFK and Stalin. So because that comma is missing in that second piece, um, the strippers is actually uh, acting as an adjective for JFK and Stalin, as you can see in this picture. Right? So it is syntactically ambiguous. Okay. So let's go on to talk about linguistic competence. Um, our linguistic competence is also uh, determined by our knowledge of words and their different parts of speech. Um, English words may be placed into two categories, lexical uh, word categories and functional word categories. Um, and we talked about this in the morphology session, if you remember. It's the lexical word categories that get the inflectional and derivational suffixes. Um, functional word categories never get any morphemes. Okay, so we're going to expand on that and talk about how that relates to syntax. So lexical word categories, remember, include nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Um, with sp we're going to focus specifically on verbs at the moment. Uh, and to uh, keep your eye on the fact that verbs are categorized in three ways. There are lexical verbs, and those are your doing verbs. You're, and you can think of them as like run, eat, sing, drink drive, walk, right? You're doing verbs. There's also a category called auxiliary verbs, and this is uh, this includes three verbs only, be, have, and do. And be, have, and do are put aside because when you combine these with lexical verbs, you change the tense. So let's, talk, let's, let's use an example. Let's see have, right? So eat is simple present tense. I eat the burger. If we put have in front of eat to change the tense of the verb, it would be I have eaten the burger, right? And have eaten is present perfect tense. If we take be, to be is conjugated as in I am, you are, he, she is. Um, and so we can uh, put a version of that like I am eating the burger, right? And that would be present continuous tense. Um, and so you can see that these auxiliary verbs are put together in a category because together with lexical verbs, they change the tense of verbs. And then the last category are modal verbs. Modal verbs are can, could, will, would, shall, shall should, may, might, must. 
Um, note that there is a distinction between modal verbs and lexical and auxiliary verbs. Lexical and auxiliary verbs can stand by themselves. Modal verbs cannot. Okay? Try and construct a sentence with one of these modal verbs. Um, you really can't do that. Um, it really, and, and if you're able to, if you say something like, oh, I can, what you're doing is you're actually referencing a past verb, a verb that's been said uh, recently that you're referencing. Um, but modal verbs also play a role. So, for example, we use these words, these modal verbs, to sort of temper or nuance our meaning, right? So, if we say, I eat the burger, versus I could eat the burger, right? Could is telling us that we have an option. What happens if we take out could and we use would? I would eat the burger, right? Now it's a sort of, um, you're setting up a, a possibility. What happens if we put I should eat the burger? Now you're stating that there's some sort of um, uh, uh, precedence where you have to eat the burger. Okay, so notice how each one of those modal verbs changes the nuance in the verb. Okay? And that's why the combination of these, where you could say, I could have eaten the burger, that could tells us something, that have changes the tense of the verb, um, and all of those things are organized in a particular way, right? Where the modal comes first, the auxiliary comes after, and then and last is the lexical verb. In functional word categories, that's determinants, prepositions, and conjunctions. Remember that all of these have their particular place in a sentence. Um, we're going to focus on prepositions for a moment. And I just want to point out to you that um, one of the areas that English language learners have the most trouble in, in English, is with prepositions. And this is an example. So here you can see in. Uh, two Spanish, uh, two sentences in Spanish, right? Ella está en Nueva York meaning she is in New York. El perro está en la mesa. The dog is on the table. You can see that the use of N in both of these sentences is used, is, is actually, it translates into different prepositions in English. Uh, the first one being in, and the second one being on. So um, that is very common, um, especially for Spanish speakers. Uh, they have to learn the different prepositions that we have in English. And we have uh, a lot more than uh, they do in Spanish. Okay, so now we're going to talk about linguistic uh, competence in terms of transforming questions, negative statements, and passive statements. And this, uh, this, in, in order to do this, we use our knowledge of the um, uh, the verb categories, right? That the lexical, the auxiliary, and the modal verbs. So if we take the statement, "You read books," okay. Um, if we want to make this a, a, a yes or no question, what we do is we put the auxiliary verb do in front of you read books. Do you read books? And now this becomes a yes-no question. If we want to make it a question word question, we have to put a question word in front of the do, right? When do you read books? Uh, when we talk about negative statements, what we have to do is something different. So we take the, the word, the sentence, you read books, and we enter in the auxiliary verb before our lexical verb read, right? Just like we did in the yes-no question. But now we have to enter an adverb in front of that lexical or main verb, right? So it's you do not read books. And that's a transformation where you go from that positive statement to that negative statement. And lastly, in order to create a passive statement, what you have to do is you have to take that object, right, that direct object, books, um, use the auxiliary verb be, put it in front of our main verb or lexical verb read, and then um, in front of that previous subject, we put the by you. So we get books are read by you. This knowledge is important because it helps you to describe to your ELL students how they're going to rearrange the words and sentences to make each of these different types of statements. Okay, let's also talk about linear word order in languages. Um, in English, word order is very important, and it's actually more rigid than in other languages. Um, so, for example, in English, we would say, uh, John lost his pants. Right? Subject, verb, object. John lost his pants. Um, 
And you would do this also in other languages. Chinese, the Chinese, either in Mandarin or Cantonese, they use subject, verb, object, order. So does Spanish. But in Spanish, you have the option um, of being a little bit more flexible. So the traditional word order is subject, verb, object. But you can be a little bit more flexible and say, uh, uh, for example, um, John his pants lost, right? Or lost John his pants. We also have subject object verb order, which would be John his pants lost. And notice how the object now comes before the verb. Um, and this would be common in Korean, Japanese, Farsi, and Hindi. Verb subject object would look like lost John his pants. And this is common in Arabic, Hebrew, and Irish. Uh, the Irish speak Gaelic. Uh, and then we also get verb object subject, which is much less common. Um, and it's, talked in, it's used in some languages, such as uh, Nias and Malagasy. And it would look like lost his pants, John. So uh, now I'm going to uh, have you do activity three, which is to see if you can detect and describe the word order or the syntax in each of these sentences um, which are from different languages. So remember that some languages are more flexible than others in terms of the word order. So even though uh, Mandarin uh, was an example of a language that had subject, verb, object, word order, it might differ uh, in some of these sentences or phrases because the languages are more flexible than others. Okay? So what I want you to do is go through each of these um, statements in the different sentences um, in different languages and identify if it's SVO, OVS, or um, VSO. And what you can do is press pause. Once you're done, come back and we'll go over it together. Okay, so if we talk about English first, we know that it's subject, verb, object, object being the shops, right? S V O. Spanish, we have subject is Maria, tiene is the verb, una bolsa blanca is the object, so it's S V O. But what we can see the difference in between Spanish and English is that. Uh, the adjective white, which would usually come before the noun bag in English, comes afterwards in Spanish. So that's a difference between languages. In Italian, it would be S, V, O. In German, it would be object, right? My parents, right? Would be the object. Am writing as the verb. And then I is the subject. So it would be O, V, S. And then we have French, so it would be subject, uh, verb would be the A, and then object, uh, so SVO for French, but also similar to Spanish, uh, we have the, the adjective coming after the noun versus before in English. Korean, we see subject first, right, subject, the object next, that book, and then C, so it's S O V. In Celeries, we have take as the verb first, object, and then the subject. So, verb, object, subject, V O S. Arabic, we have the verb, then the subject, and then the object. So, V S O. In Japanese, we have the subject, the object, and then the verb, so S O V. Okay, um, so now we're going to get into our fourth activity, and this is just to help you try to uh, diagram out a sentence um, in English, and then we're going to diagram its translation out in another, in another language, okay? So what I want you to do is, um, I've put the parts of speech for you at the bottom here. Um, you can click on activity 4 link, which is in the syntax unit where you're seeing this video. Um, uh, open it and try and diagram this out. It's easier if you do it on paper. Um, if you haven't printed it out, maybe you can write out the sentence and diagram it out on a piece of paper. Remember that you want to start with your noun phrases. Okay? Noun phrases first. Then you want to ask yourself if those noun phrases should be connected. And they only should be connected if that information uh, is modifying the previous noun phrase, okay?
Um, so we'll regroup. I'll give you a second. You can pause, uh, complete it, and then I'll go over it with you. Okay, so let's go over it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is look at our noun phrases. Okay, so these are our noun phrases. We have the bus, noun phrase. We have the poor child, which is a noun phrase that has an adjective. We have the bad man, which is a noun phrase with an adjective. Okay, then we ask ourselves, is on the bus modifying the poor child, or is on the bus modifying where the man abandoned the, the child? Okay, hopefully you said the latter, right? It's where the man abandoned the child. So this becomes a prepositional phrase, which is not going to be connected to this noun phrase because it's not modifying that noun phrase. So then we see that there's a, there's a verb in front of this noun phrase, right? So this tells us that this becomes a verb phrase. Um, and so together it is sentence equals noun phrase plus verb phrase plus prepositional phrase. Hopefully you got that. Okay, so now what I'm going to give you is, an, is the same sentence, but it is translated in Fijian, okay? Um, and if you just take a second to look at Fijian, um, see if you can determine the linear word order, right? Is it SVO, OVS, or VSO? Okay, so hopefully you said V, because you see the verb is first, O, because the child was the object, and then the man is the S, right, the subject, um, because that comes last. So it's actually, so Fijian, the word order of Fijian is V-O-S, okay? So, V-O-S, that tells you a lot, right? V-O-S. Now what I want you to do is diagram this sentence out. Keep in mind that you know that it's a VOS language, okay? Um, so on that same sheet that you downloaded to do that other activity that we just completed, um, go ahead and pause the video. Um, again, focus on your noun phrases first and ask yourself if those noun phrases modify each other. If they do, you want to connect them. If you don't, you want to keep them separate. Okay, so let's go through it together. Um, and here are your parts of speech for you. So first we have noun phrase, the child. Um, together with the adjective makes that noun phrase, right? Um, with the verb, it makes it the verb phrase. Then we have another noun phrase, the man. And bad, because bad is the adjective to the noun phrase. And then we have on the bus, right? So determination, determiner noun, and then prepositional noun. Um, are you going to connect this prepositional phrase with this noun phrase? Is on the bus modifying the bad man at all? The answer is no. On the bus is modifying the verb phrase. Okay, so it's not connected. So it equals S equals VP plus NP plus PP. Notice how that that equation, S equals VP plus NP plus PP, is the same as what we got with our English version, okay? Um, so even though the verb phrase moved around, right, the prepositional phrase moved around because of that linear word order, ultimately the diagramming is the same. 